Our next speaker this morning is uh, Don French, who is here joining us from the Department of Zoology at Oklahoma State University. He's Associate Professor of Zoology there, PhD in Zoology from Indiana, and his bachelor and uh, master's are uh, in biology from Fordham. And he's here to talk to us this morning about uh, directing inquiry-based laboratories. So, Don? All right, I rarely use a microphone because I'm used to yelling in a large room. So if I'm too loud, just sort of tell me to tone it down a bit, because that's not going to happen normally. All right. Um, and this may be a bit of a double header, so to speak, because what I was going to do is talk for this first session on our efforts to change a course from what it was to what it is, the pitfalls, the problems, and then we can engage in some laboratory stuff as well this afternoon. So sort of so in the next hour, Right now, it's more about lecture and the problems getting there, and we can go from there. Uh, a couple of disclaimers. All right, I always like to put, up, put people to give me money up front because I don't want to forget at the end. And if you would like your name there, feel free to contact me <laughs> at the end of this presentation. It's never a problem. All right, let's see if magic works this way. OK, for my disclaimer, because I've been listening to the people that have been in here so far, um, I am not an engineer or a physicist or a chemist. All right, I am, my PhD is in ethology. So I am a card carrying animal behavior person. And my background is in, in behavior in biology. Furthermore, I'm not a science educator. I am now, okay. Um, but I learned my education like I learned science, if you will, from the literature, from colleagues, and from experimenting. I have no, if you will, formal training that's either good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Let's see. Oh, good. All right. The next part about the setting, unlike Olin and a lot of other places, I'm looking at 1,000 students spread across a number of sections. We're a large land-grant institution. And I, when I say unlike Olin, just the good, it's an interesting contrast to go from 350 to the size of our institution. Research, of course, is our primary focus. Um, from our faculty, we have a combined introductory biology and majors and non-majors I'll talk about, number of students, approximately 1,600 students per year, 1,000 in the fall, 600 or so in the spring. And as we say, our admission requirements are an ACT of 21 is the minimum score for regular admission, at least officially. I have seen scores in the, as low as nine, okay? And the top third of a graduating class, officially seven, keep in mind, some of our students out in Felt, Oklahoma, and other places might be graduating in from a class of seven. So it's a very different environment. And I say this always to people because setting a context tells you something about what I'm going to be talking about. It's nice to say we have these ideas, but will they scale? Will they move to where you are? So now you can place yourself and say, I'm going to bet, you know, whether this works or not. I'm going to refer, among other things, to the uh, SESD position statement is just a way of looking at the SESD is a site of college science teachers. Apparently my, my CV up there is, is, a little, is a little bit dated, but that's because we're busy doing other things. Um, I am past president of that society. I'm now, by the way, president of, this, of the National Association for Bio, president-elect for the National Association of Biology Teachers. So if there are any biologists out there, please come talk to me and we'll talk about joining other colleagues. All right, the major goals of an introductory science course are to contribute to the scientific literacy and critical thinking capability of all college students and to provide a conceptual base for subsequent courses taken in the disciplines. A very nice statement. Nowhere in here do we have an emphasis on me me memorizing the stages of mitosis, which on the other hand seems to be where we are. So we look at things, okay? We say to ourselves, why do we teach the way we do? And I know out there I'm looking at some people, some of you are gonna sing along with me because you're already in the choir. Some of you are going to sing along, well, maybe not, because you're truly skeptics and others are looking for new ideas. So absolutely. Why do we teach the way we do? It is the way we were taught. We find the style most comfortable. My advisor, as we say, bless his heart, he is he's no longer with us. He, he passed away quite young. He taught me a lot about being a faculty member, how to design curriculum for a course. You pick a book with 42 chapters. <laughs> because there are 45 lectures in a semester and there are three exams. I love the man dearly. He was a great man. 
But, well, all right. But are these good reasons? What is good for the students is not always what's good for the professors. I would argue, actually, it can be. Because changing what you teach makes you happy. You enjoy it, they enjoy it. But not if we stand there and say, oh gosh, I've got to go to lecture today. Either you or them. We know this, all right? This is just a, so you see this lots of times on the web. We could sit there and debate this. The learning triangle, I look at my students always, be one with the triangle. All right, if we look at this and we say, it's my 60s heritage, what can I tell you? Um, if we look at this, very common, we can debate the details of it or whatever, but the point is, if this is correct, why then do we think that lectures work? If we throw bricks of knowledge at the heads of students, why are we surprised they duck? <laughs> this is no surprise, really. So we wanted to change things. We want to say, no, they're not blank slates or empty vessels to be filled, all right? They have to learn to build connections. I have heard, and you will continue to hear wonderful ideas. All right? I laugh all the time. The students that you haven't taught me, all learning occurs on their side. We can only set it up for them to learn, for better or for worse. Okay? Organization reflects connections. If they have no framework they can build on, they tend not to learn it. If they can, they do. The richer the, con the, richer the net we build, the more connections they can make, Right? And this is before I knew anything about a lot of modern uh, understanding of cognitive work. All right, what should a class look like, at least from our standpoint? Now, unlike everybody else, I'm going to demonstrate right here in a large class what we can do. All right, so what I need to do, and this will frighten you right away, but if we know anything about physiology, a little adrenaline gets you more alert, <laughs> and that's good. The other advantage is you've been sitting here for at least an hour, so you dozed off a long time ago. Luckily, I am tall and handsome, and so it's not an issue. All right, so what I'd like you to do, could I get a volunteer or two? I should just run up and down the room and do this as I would normally do. Actually, our own students carry their index cards. So what I need is for someone to be so kind, young and virile, all right, to pat, young and virile, That's if you be so kind, and just pass those back or walk back to the students. Normally, I would happily walk back, and what I want you to do is just find at least two friends. Make new friends if you didn't come with any. My students come built in with friends, so feel free by this point. So take a card, one, one, piece done. one per group of three or four or so, which is what we do, except our groups are already set. And so now that I've got you doing that, I know you're capable of doing this. And again, I apologize. Normally, I would run back and forth, but more of my stuff is not set up the way I would want. This is a wonderful classroom. I can run back and forth and stay fit. OK, you have cards here, you have friends. Are you left out? Friends. Your friends? OK, your friends behind you, perhaps. All right, so here's what I want you to do. All right, so what I'm going to do now, this is about the sixth or seventh week into our class, so my students are much better at this than you are. You're fumbling around looking for stuff. All I have to do is say, get out your cards, and they pull out their 5 by 8 index cards, and they are ready. So, ah. Uh, I've got you thinking or worrying. Did I have is that anything embarrassing on my card? Did I write a note on it already? I hate to ask. There should be nothing on that card. If there's something on there, a laundry list, a note to an old girlfriend, nothing like that, please. All right. With that in mind, I'll see if I can get my magic to work. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to listen. Nice and simple. I want you to listen. And at the end, essentially, there will be a question. So now your adrenaline's pumping a little higher. Excellent. All right. See if the magic works. Once again, here we go. I was thrilled to be going on my first diving expedition for the Smithsonian. Fortunately for me, I had diving certification as well as a biology degree. And I had been hired to gather algae for the museum collections. As I descended to 15 meters, all was going well, but I realized that I had forgotten my gloves. Carefully, I started gathering algae samples, which appeared greenish-brown, placing them into my collection bag. I must not have been careful enough, though, because later I noticed a cut on my finger, perhaps from some coral nearby. Much to my surprise, my blood had a sickly greenish-brown color. 
Somewhat alarmed about the fact that I was bleeding green, I ascended to the dive boat. To my relief, when I sat down on the boat, my blood once again appeared red. As I opened my collection bag, I discovered that the algae was now red also. It took me a few minutes to figure out what was going on. Okay, you have your few minutes, not many, but you all have PhDs in a variety of fields, so it shouldn't take you what it takes my students. What I would like from you is all the hypotheses that your group can come up with. Not just the ones that are good, I want the bad ones too. As many hypotheses you can come up with in the next two minutes on that card, go. Remember, good ones and bad ones, I don't just want the good ones. <laughs> Okay, normally we would go on for a few more minutes, but for today, because I'm constrained, if you'd be so, oh, we've got them. Okay, we're used to, Bob, you're right, I need that giant mic. No, here we go. All right, so normally I would collect all these cars, we start talking about them. Okay, now on those cars, I'm just curious, since you seem to be a very competitive lot, when I said go, I didn't see anyone going, I don't know, I don't want to do this. All right, so I'm just curious, all right? Um, how many have five or more hypotheses? Six or more, seven or more? Seven, do I hear more? Okay, I would have, a, oh, I hear more than seven? Eight. All right, you're fine, you're at excellent school. I really appreciate that. The record is 11 at Idaho State. Because they had optometry faculty in as well and had some very interesting viewpoints. So you have many hypotheses, good ones and bad ones, I hope. Why do I want both? I want both because some of you have written, if you've done your job well, certainly my students have no problem saying, because there's no oxygen underwater, for example. And a number of other misconceptions that come out. If you would just put your hand up in front of an entire class and said, I know, I know, we would have an issue. But I don't know if that was your good hypothesis or your bad hypothesis. That could have been a bad one. And so we want to validate the opportunity. They worked in groups. The cards are handed in anonymously. We can discuss them. We break down those ideas and see where we're going to go. Inevitably, people will start talking about, um, inevitably, people start talking about, hopefully, um, color in some way. Here's my dive bag, by the way, so we can actually see the different algae. Here is a graph that we could talk about later on. We're looking at absorption, all right, tra uh, penetrance of vari at various wavelengths depending upon the depth. So we have the opportunity to discuss this, all right? So we're gonna take the hypotheses that the students have used and use them as starting off points to look at a variety of factors. Where am I really going? Well, a number of things, okay? I can go a number of different ways with this. And I have some colleagues now in, in a physics department who happily use this story as a way of introducing um, Physical, physics concepts, whatever those are, being a simple biologist as I am. You know, they sounded good. He said, he said something physicky. All right, so with that in mind, yes, you're welcome. Um, but we can talk about a variety of things, all right? We can talk about, well, the eye and how it sees color. And we can look at various, we can review this. We can review, as we would do, neurons because we've done laboratories already where they can recognize cell types and talk about cell types. We're going to look at receptors in a little more detail because they've done these cells in lab. They should be able to recognize this. They've done things already to allow them to do that. I'm going to skip for today because of time. By the way, this takes about a, about a, it's about a week to two weeks depending upon which directions we go. Do you try to connect a lot of things? We remind them we've discussed action potentials before. Now we want them to relate to the sensory system from where they were earlier, looking at the chemical changes that occur in action potentials now to remind of electrical potential and how this works as well. Um, 
and a variety of things. What else can we do with the eye? Let's go back to the eye for just a moment. Let's talk a little bit about something else near and dear to our hearts. Let's talk about natural selection. All right, very quickly, I have this environment here. What time of year is it? I hear some winners. I hear some I don't knows. Much more honest. Okay, most people are driven. I will usually get, well, it's either spring or summer or winter or fall. All right. And, and that's fine. So we can imagine for the moment, and you can imagine the problems here. We've got this butterfly searching around for whatever it is that, you know, they do. Okay, going on there. Is there more information here? What's happened if I add this? Can you now perhaps propose a better? Okay, so is there an evolutionary advantage to seeing color? What might be there in terms of, of the information available? Because we're going to visit the idea of natural selection, because by the way, we might understand why the blood is a certain color, and even as we'll get to why the plants are that color, but we still have to ask ourselves what could be possible evolutionary mechanisms driving that. So our role is to try to connect things in a variety of ways, as we'll talk about. There's some, there are built-in exercises. Where are we ultimately going? Well, um, I'll give you a quick pathway. We're going to go ultimately here to photosynthesis in which people, and we've already, the students have done this before, I might sit here with this animation and I can start my animation. We've led to this after a variety of ways. And I sit here and I let this animation run. All right? And conceptualize, ask myself, students, what's happening here? I want you to derive 10, I'm not going to ask you to do this today. I want you to write down, I don't know, in a group of four, 15 questions that you can come up with looking at that. Well, I can tell you right now, in any size class, if I ask a group for 10 or 15 questions, I have the, everything I've ever wanted to know about photosynthesis that I want them to know in that set of questions. And we can triage those. The, what are the purple things, which is always an embarrassing question. All right, <laughs> but that's okay. You gotta start somewhere. It's some kind of, what are the purple things, all right? Go home and read this. The what's you can answer, the why's, we might have to work on the how's, we, you know, what's going on here? And we can work this out. So the students are engaged in selecting the questions, at least here. We can go, ultimately, we're going to talk about all the aspects of what goes on in photosynthesis. All right. And by the way, our students, by now, they look at these. They say, oh, wait a minute. Is that an ATP synthase? Because we saw the ATP. They get out their diagrams from the cellular respiration in a different scenario we had earlier. And they can rapidly connect the two and begin to say, I understand what's going on by looking at, uh, by looking at this and recalling from what? what we've seen before. And this goes on and on. We have, well, we'll, we'll, go back to, we'll go back to here. Hopefully things will run and life will be good. So we didn't always teach like this. We used to have traditional courses, all right? And in those traditional courses, all right, we went in textbook order, talked to at them, all right? Our measure of success was greatest number of facts per unit time delivered at the students is I really think that's exactly what we did. All right, so what was our motivation for change? At least our students thought, students lack reasoning skills, all right, pretty obvious. What do the students think? Course lacks relevance, faculty can't teach, I'm only memorizing, this is really boring. Okay, and if you haven't heard the word boring in a while, excellent. All right, I'm glad to hear, I'm glad for you. Impact of the courses. We did some survey work using a standard uh, an instrument here. And here's what we know, all right? Yes, that is negative. That is, our non-majors were not as badly affected by our teaching of biology as our majors were. Fewer of them were turned off. Gee, there's a success story if I ever heard one. This is in our old courses. And this is not surprising. There were a lot of studies at that time suggesting something very similar. We looked at, of all places, non-major courses. Why are they engaged better? What are they enjoying? Their problems there, I heard, relate to people. This is the issue. It is not marching through. What are the properties of water? NADH is, OK, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It is trying to tie material in. OK. So I would argue, and depending on the length of a lecture, that we have to take our skeptics out there some of our true believers and get a common view, a shared vision. Well, how do we do that? If you want to start anything, how do you proceed? What is the first thing you do 
as university faculty when you have to get some job accomplished? Get a committee, all right. <laughs> Let's see, and the answer is like family feud. And the answer is, first step, form a committee. If you're biologists out there, what is the first thing the faculty start discussing about any course or courses when a committee gets together? What? Yes, the first step of any good committee is argue about the content incessantly. What should we be teaching? Oh, the steps of mitosis are very important. Absolutely, they have to know them all. Why? Because I don't want to teach them in my class. That's exactly what we heard. Not surprising. Typical design. Now, maybe many of us are better. This is 10 years ago. You're more enlightened than we were back then, I have no doubt. All right? Look up those topics. By the way, I teach a course. I'm, I'm also the coordinator of the University Faculty Preparation Program. And I teach a course and on how to be a faculty member, what are the things. And in that discussion, the first time we had a panel discussion, my new young charges out there, look at the future, ask the faculty panel, how did you develop your first course? Because I'm going to be out there someday. And to a, I hate to say man in this particular case, yes, that particular group, to a person, I'll be good. Uh, they said, well, you went on the web. I found a few syllabi. I picked one I liked. I used it. Right. Thank you. I saw that. That was excellent. All right. For a program, curriculum changes when people die. <laughs> we discussed this last night. Kuhn's greatest vision. Paradigm shifts are about death and evolution. <laughs> Most of us know this now. You start, with, you start hopefully with what do you want them to know, what do you want them to be able to do, what habits of mind do you want them to have. This is not a trivial thing to do. Because you can argue, and you sit there and you say, and are you, why do they have to know each of these things? All right, you develop assessments, you develop activities, you'll see that the idea of backwards design has become quite common to understand and to use this approach. All right. All right. Number of things to consider among them are most of our students are not formal thinkers. All right. So they need things to relate to. By the way, we take you out of your field. You're not a formal thinker all either. You get lost and start saying, "Can I have an? Ex what exactly do you mean by that? How many times do people approach education faculty and say, "Oh, that's a lot of jargon. I don't understand it." Yet in their own fields in, micro, in molecular biology, they would happily give me a litany of terminology and never define it and expect me to know. When you're outside your field, you're, you need those concrete examples. I watch my students having to explain to faculty what they're talking about because my students do, coll do college, uh, sorry, science education. All right. There's a disconnect in overall goals. Here's what faculty think they're doing. Ask everybody. Oh, I teach critical thinking and concept mastery. But what they're actually testing is knowledge acquisition and communication skills at best. All right, students on the hand think it's all job preparation. I, there was a comment yesterday about those checklists. They check through their courses. They know they've got them now, and they move on. All right, our simple approach, stories or situations about topics of students to which students can relate using concepts faculty used in their research. Why should I know that? If you say, ah, oh, because they have to, that's not a reason. Have you used that in the last 30 years? All right? And if you can do that, oh, it's wonderful to work with faculty. You can say, well, this is what I do with it. And we can talk to the students about that. I hear that in the engineering curriculum. I hear that in physics. I do not hear that in biology curriculum nearly enough. OK? Interesting on a need-to-know basis. This is our way of putting it. It's, you know, when you need the information, look it up. Now they can look it up. My goodness, it's frightening what they start to do now. My, my, my standard line in class now is shake your phone. They have those iPhones. They can get the information. All right, but we want to introduce, introduce topics and information on a need-to-know basis. I didn't have to teach you about the properties of water and how electrons were or anything else before we got to photosynthesis. At least we have a reason to start asking you what's happening and why. Solve problems, hopefully things that we thought were fun. There are more sophisticated recent approaches to looking at curriculum. And I would recommend that the people start looking at that hierarchical framework out of MIT. is a very interesting document. Well, I'm not going to say it's well tested, but it certainly is a framework to look at how one might organize a curriculum and the time it takes to do so. Vision and Change is coming out, the document out of 
out of the AAAS, sponsored by NSF, the conference this year, looking at the big ideas. So their ideas are out there for saying what should they be. Okay. So our new course, a single one semester general education class. All right. I lost track of when I started, so someone should tell me when I should shut up. It's got three, four minutes. Oh, yeah, that's going to be good. All right. So <laughs> not a problem. All right. I think I've introduced you to a lot of this. Actually, just a review there. All right. So we're in a classroom like this. We are not in a small class, so we're not in anything special. We're trying to get students to do what we need in groups like this. And I'll talk about the lab component as well. It's integrated into lecture. Hopefully, we have a problem in lecture that the students can then investigate in lab, come back to lecture with it, so that laboratories give them the basis of data, the basis of practice, the concrete skills they need to go back into lecture. All right, 10 different scenarios that integrate information throughout. All right, we apply things in various situations. Here's our surface to volume ratio. Every textbook, by the way, I've ever seen talks about size of a cell, as if that's the only place you know, that surface to volume ratio has an effect. We use it over and over throughout the course as something for students to think about in terms of why things are uh, have evolved the way they are. We try to integrate concepts across. We'll start with the biome and get down to cellular respiration, not just, not just a particular concept or a particular level, sorry, a particular level of approach. Okay. We have 35 to 63 groups out there. They're the same groups throughout the semester. They're regularly given the opportunity throughout class to discuss things. All right. Variety of things. We now use clickers. We started out with our index cards, actually sheets of paper that we cut up. Then we learned to tell the students to bring five by eight index cards. That way we can just say, get out a card. And we're not spending our time trying to run up and down the aisles, which I'm out there all the time anyway. I just can't be every place at once. Okay. Here's a quickie question now, a clicker question. All right. Very simple. Always expand, shrink, no change. It's scary with clickers. Simple question, you get one third, one third, one third. <laughs> That's excellent though. Okay. We look for those discrepant events. We look for setting up a question that they will all choose the wrong direction, except for a few. And the arguments that ensue get us where we want to go and have students realize that they can figure it out for themselves. Okay. A lot of support structure goes along with that. Um, grown over the years. This is probably the thing that's grown the most over the years is a combination of concept maps and, and um, tutorials and all sorts of things that are out there, which nowadays we find out, we start surveying now, what are students doing? Can students drive their own, I hate to say it, we put how much money into, into technology? Now we're finding out, oh yeah, I go to YouTube, I got these videos and I use those and I use this, you know, or my favorite, I don't learn from lecture, I learn from all the other stuff. Well, do you think we didn't design the other stuff for you as well? So. We have this in mind when we do. OK. Um, our assessments should match what we ask them to do. We have common exams. They are cumulative at all times. So in the beginning, it might be thermoregulation, and then it might be thermoregulation and cellular respiration, and it might be thermoregulation, cellular respiration, and you know, uh, genetics. And we're asking for questions or the nervous system. All right, a quick example of one of our, and yes, they're multiple choice, but here's a multiple choice question we're asking our students to do, which we're pretty proud of the level we can get them to in terms of the idea. This would be a trick question over here, only A, B, and C. I like that idea. I have to use that in the future as a technique. OK, so to sum it up, OK, decide the outcome, decide the assessment. Design engagement activities, put things in a context, put things that students can relate to. There are many small and simple things that you can do even in a large lecture hall that allow students to have not only an active learning by discussion, but, but data that they can collect. And in my quote lab discussion this half, a little later on, I'll show you things that will work just as easily in a lecture. All right, with that in mind, I will stop, entertain a question if you would like, and we can discuss more later on, folks. Take one and then work with breakout sessions, right? Is that what you see you went entirely away from the cards and all the clickers? No, okay. definitely not. They have different advantages, they're completely different tools.
That was a short one. Anybody have a? <laughs> we can oh, take a longer question. There's another row we can hold them. Uh, Richard. Can you elaborate on the advantages of, the advantages of the different choices? OK. Clickers were obviously giving them a precise choice. It depends on the kind of question you want. If I say I want all your hypotheses to get you thinking, clickers aren't going to do any good. If I say draw a graph, uh, Bob's examples the other day, draw a graph of what you would predict an endotherm would be like under the following, we could actually have them do that. But we find that they have to struggle more when they do that later on. We might, so many activities they can do that involve drawing, conceptualization, uh, long <laughs> lists of material that they're trying to put together. Maybe I missed it, but do you address misconceptions in biology? For example, in uh, photosynthesis and respiration, do you address misconceptions that students might have? Do we address misconceptions they might have? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I didn't see it. I, you didn't mention it. I, probably I missed it, but I'm just asking you. You do address misconceptions. Um, we can visit later on, but that, but that is the point of, for example, bringing out those cards, asking what hypotheses they have. Those are driven from misconceptions. All right, when they come up with ideas, you can spot them pretty rapidly. And as we all know, there's some pretty frightening and interesting ones all right, out there. But that's what it is. There's a lot of small discussion. They're working in small groups to do this just like you were. It gives an opportunity to discuss this. They might prompt ideas out there. We can say, OK, so what's really going on here? So absolutely, absolutely. Don, I'm going to interrupt yeah, since sure. we are a few minutes behind schedule already. And let's thank Don one more time. This program is protected by a copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.